Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I'm Robert Winfrey. I'm your host for this show. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you for following on whatever medium you achieve, you get your podcast through, be that YouTube, Google Play, uh, Apple Music, uh, Transistor, or just the 411 Mania website because these are all posted there as well. Uh, However you come to us, thank you very much for being here. On the show this evening, we have a review of last night's event, UFC on ESPN Plus 14. It was not a very good event. Uh, The main event was only interesting to those of you who really like breaking down the minutia of technique. And even then, it was still pretty lackadaisical. Co-main event, good brawl. Uh, Best thing on the card, really. Other than that, eh... We'll get into some of that in a bit of detail, and the rest of it will just pass unremarked, as it was unremarkable. Also, tonight we have a preview of UFC 241, which is, you know what, that's a really good card. I mean, okay, there's a couple of fights that you look at and go, eh, but top to bottom, that's a really solid card. I don't have a whole lot of complaints about that card. So let's all hope it holds together because there's a few parties in there that uh, historically, you know, have had issues. So cross your fingers and then we'll talk about news such as it was. Really slow news week. Um, Really slow news week on the MMA side of things. All right, here with me as usual, my regular partner in crime, 411 Mania's Jeff Harris. Because uh, I botched his intro because I suck. Jeff, how are you this evening? If I could have a lifetime supply of any drink, it would be clearly Canadian. So if someone wants to work on that for me, please do. Do they still manufacture that? I mean, I bought it the other day, so yes. I'll have to look that up. Because you have been singing its praises for a while now. I mean, there was a time where I couldn't find it anywhere. Now I found a place that's selling it. So someone's bottling it. Someone's Someone has a license for it. And, and it's still the same recipe. So it's, it's good. I will look for uh, some of that and then potentially give you my own review. Got a great crisp taste. And, you know... A lot of people try the sparkling flavored water thing, but no one does it as good as Clearly Canadian. And I tried imitators, and Clearly Canadian went away for a while. Now, I'm able to have it again, so... I think everyone is just sort of behind the mark on what Clearly Canadian is doing with sparkling water, with natural ingredients... Um, that's bottled and tastes like the crispest thing you will ever taste. Incidentally, to whoever is manufacturing this, we are available to uh, read your copy if you want to sponsor the show. I mean, I would not even need a sponsorship to sing the praises of this drink. Um, I would accept a lifetime su- supply, though, so... All right. On that note, let's get into something that no one wants a lifetime supply of UFC on ESPN plus 14, because boy, soon- happy. yeah, look, I said last week, there's a couple of hidden gems on here that might be OK. And there, in fairness, there were a couple. I said the main event was a- I said the main event was perfectly acceptable as a main event. And on paper, it is and was in practice. It was not. In practice, it wasn't a good fight. I mean, there's not really any way to go around that. Um, Valentina Shevchenko defend, successfully defends the Women's Flyweight Championship, defeating Liz Carmouche via unanimous decision, 50-45 across the board. I what take minor issues. Nothing ish- happened in the first two rounds. Like, I could have easily scored those first two rounds 10-10 just for the lack of activity. Uh, all right. I... The fight, I was terrible. You the could. fight was terrible. It's it's probably the worst chip check fight I recall in her UFC career. And I don't recall a worse fight. As far as a worse one, 
When did she debut? She debuted fighting... Um, 2019, Sarah Kaufman. Sarah Kaufman, yeah. I wanted to say McMahon. But yeah. So Kaufman was her debut. Upset Holly Holm. Yep. Submitted Julian and Pena. Mm-hmm. Practically murdered... Uh, uh, Ka- Priscilla Cashwaya. Cashwaya in a really one-sided, nasty fight. Um... Pretty much shut out Ioana. Well, th- even that was better than this. It was. Well, Ioana's a more activity-based fighter than Karmush is. Um, I don't even know what Karmush was doing that whole fight. Like what? I. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that she had a massive issue of depth perception because everything she was throwing was about six inches too short to actually make contact with Valentina. That's the it, only well, acceptable excuse. It's it's. Because nothing really, she did matter. You know, we really need like like a talent influx at women's flyweight, but just women's in general. And look, I mean, not that Shevchenko isn't a huge mountain to climb, but excuse me, I mean, Karmush just—it felt like she wasn't even clear. trying. Well, not she wasn't even. She looked nowhere close like she belonged in a UFC title competition last night. And, and 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 not to say she's a bad fighter, she she's, isn't. No, she's a good she fighter, look, but she didn't look title caliber. She didn't look like someone who had earned a title fight last night, or she didn't even look like she cared that she was in a title fight. Like she didn't. What what was even the game plan? I can't like even begin to plan. extrapolate. And Based on the evidence. No, I'm not a fighter. I've never gotten in there. But I mean, what am? I, what else am I supposed to say about a performance like that? Look, it, even people it, who, ha- even someone who has been in there, and I've, again, I've never competed in mixed martial arts. Uh, my competition fighting background is very, very limited. I do more training than actually fighting, all things considered. Right. But given what she was doing, I can't even begin to roughly extrapolate what her game like, plan might have been. And I like women's MMA. I mean, and I have for a long time. I like Shevchenko. He's one of my favorites. Um, I I had, I didn't have high hopes for this fight, but I hoped it would be better than what we received last night. Even when Shevchenko was dominating, it was just fairly uneventful. And she was doing things. Um, the crowd, I mean, the crowd wasn't really all that enthused by it either. So, I mean, I, normally I, I'm not at all shy about telling crowds they suck if the crowd sucks. Right. Last night's crowd didn't suck. Uh, that was just an utterly unengaging fight from a fan perspective. And that's not to, and let me be clear, that's not saying, again, neither woman is a bad fighter. They're not. Shevchenko's an incredibly talented fighter. Liz Carmouche is probably the second best flyweight that Shevchenko's fought behind Joanna. And it's again, sometimes this just happens. And that again, that's not to excuse uh, some of the questionable decisions that are made. It's not to say that again, either of them is bad. Just sometimes this happens when you get fighters together. So who does Valentina fight next? Do you put her in there with a Chukagian or do you kind of wait? It's, it's so up. hard. It, I don't know. It's so hard to figure out because it's pretty clear that the UFC are keen on the idea of a third fight with her and Nunes. Every time Valentina fights, she gets asked about it. I mean, and you could I, do that. You could, and on a pure I don't merit. Know. Seem, I don't know. I don't. It doesn't seem like a great idea right now. I agree with you. I don't think it's the best idea in the world. And yeah, Valentina she's is lost, on paper. My problem is on paper she's already lost to Amanda twice, and I don't know. I just I don't see a fight where Valentina will come out declared the victor at this point. If she does, it'll probably be another uh, hotly contested split decision that just happens to lean her way officially instead of Amanda's. That's just kind of how they match up. 
I'd rather they hold that off for a little bit. And yeah, I know Amanda is miles better than everyone at Bantamweight and Featherweight. And Shevchenko is miles better than everyone else at Flyweight. And I get it. That makes you kind of want to go, okay, let's put them together instead of drumming up another either execution or just lackluster fight. Well, well, the issue is, is that the Cyborg rematch probably isn't happening for Amanda either. Definitely not at this point. It kind of leaves a bad taste in my mouth, but they might have to do it, honestly. Until the division produces both both their divisions producing the contenders. I mean, who's the next? I believe the next most logical, the next most, uh, the next deserving contender, if I can speak, as far as the rankings go at flyweight, would be Caitlin Chukagian, who should be number she one. She only has her one. She's only coming off a single win. I know over I, Calderwood. Hence, the, I'm not disagreeing with that. That's just the state of the division. Hmm. But I believe she is the Maya, next most. My missed weight in her last fight. She has two wins, though. Yeah, I don't so think you can. Kinda, it's slim pickings, really. It is at the moment. It's not a very. Not like well, weight. So I think Chukagian is probably, again, the ne- if you just want to throw the next person in line at the moment, it's Chukagian. Mm-hmm. Who All would right, get murdered. Can- I think we can go ahead and move on to the co main event and then just do quick hits for the rest of this card. There's nothing really about the rest of this card is go- worth going over in depth, I think. Yeah, anything that does strike you, I'm uh, happy to give you time to do so. Uh, yeah, the co main event Vicente Luque defeats Mike Perry via split decision 29 28, uh, twice for him, once for Perry. I have no issues with 29 28 for either man. This was a fun grueling brawl. Oh, that's surprising. Perry's a brawler, but he's not a very smart fighter, you know? Isn't this kind of the outcome I predicted last week? Yeah, I think we both picked, we both predicted Luke. Yeah, and Luke's very underrated, I feel. Uh, significantly. He should be fighting someone in the top 15, but they won't actually fade out a bunch phase out a bunch of the guys I mean, who should be phased out. Row, he should arguably be fighting someone in the top 10, Robert. I agree. I mean, he got bumped out of the top fifteen, I believe, over the la- within the last uh, is he three or four ranked? weeks. Is Luke even ranked? He used to be, and then they had to rank Jeff Neal because of Jeff Neal's most recent win. Okay, so Lawler is ranked twelve. Lawler shouldn't be there. Dosanjo shouldn't be there. Not at this point. I, I like those so guys. Something. I like watching them fight, but I don't know. I feel I feel like I feel like Luke should easily be top twelve right now. I agree completely. Maybe not ten. Maybe not ten. My, like, should Maya really be in the top ten? Mm, Damian Maya. Yeah. What was his last fight? I think he did win his last fight. I I think he did too. I just can't remember what it was. Uh oh yeah, Rocco Martin. That he barely won that fight. That should have been a draw. Yeah. So ten's a bit ten's a bit high for him, frankly. Because he did, he did lose three in a row to the yeah, top yeah. guys, but he, he still, still lost, lost three in a row. <laughs> still lost three in a row. And then beat Lyme. And look, Lyman Good and Anthony Martin are not, they're not ranked either. You know? So, I mean, should you really be in the top ten just for getting back-to-back wins over Martin and, and Good? Maybe you I, can be in the top 15, but IMHO, not the top ten. I agree. I, I, guess, uh, I don't think Maya should be there. I mean, he shouldn't be top ten. I feel like Luke is. I feel like he's definitely surging right now, and he deserves a lot more recognition. Because, um, well, this is his second barn burner of the year. Right. I mean, he had that fight with Barbarina that like, was. He's not beating ranked opponents, but I mean, look, you win six in a row in the UFC in the welterweight division, and and he has at least ten wins in the UFC. I think ten. He's ten and two. Yeah, this, that's a. That's a, that's an exceptional record. It is to be fighting. Uh, also, in the- I mean, also look at the only guys he lost to. I mean, he stumbled in his UFC debut, and then the only other guy he lost to was Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards, who's also surging right now. So there you go. Yeah, he's oh, he should Edwards- be in a better spot. So there you go. So um, I would say give him a maybe give him a lower top ten guy next. 
Yeah. Maybe not a punt. Maybe not a punt. Maybe give him Damian Maya. See how he does. I could live with but that. Damian Maya. Damian Maya, just because of his style, is a tough matchup for everybody, even at his age. You know. Yeah. A lot of people are going to have, but you need to be able to beat someone like Amaya if you want to further your career. Would you agree? I would agree with that. Yeah, you you have to be able to beat kind of the older gatekeepers. And, it, it, and it's a good fight, and I like Perry. I just don't think he's like he's good, but he's not good enough or skilled enough to to get to a higher level. Like he can have fun fights like this, and he can have barn burners, but. Kind of just, and he and he does a lot of what he does technically does tend to get overlooked in favor of people just considering him a brawler. I mean, don't get me wrong, he brawls, but he does. You know, I feel I, like he has he clearly has skills to me, but he's just not good at applying them and getting those signature wins. Is my opinion. Yeah, because I mean, he's had fights that he could have won. And because of questionable decisions, didn't I mean, again, you, if you look at how he matches up with Cowboy, that's a very, very winnable fight for him. And he fought it in a very suboptimal manner. I think a lot he's fought a lot of fights that way. And that's why he's at this point two and four in his last six. Uh, I, I will give him a ton of credit for his general toughness, though, because he had coming at the end of that fight. That is the worst broken nose I have ever seen in MMA. Yeah. I mean, and I've seen a lot. I, I was watching live both times Anderson Silva destroyed Rich Franklin's face. I watched Brandon Vera's face get rearranged by Tiago um, Silva. I Andre Arlovsky's nose is badly broken. Jerome Labanner's is badly broken. Labanner only in kickboxing. I think Randy Couture... Uh, Couture's got broken pretty badly. Um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, Vera. Um, not Vera. Uh, Tiago, uh, Tiago Santos. Because um, Carlos Condit badly shattered his nose in their fight. This is the worst I've seen in mixed martial arts. This was horrific. This was a horrifically broken nose. And he's sitting there with a broken nose, kind of locked in a loose guillotine. And he's just not going to quit. Uh, and so get, I want to give him some props for that because, I mean, I you do a third of that in terms of damage to my nose, and I'm probably just done. Like, I'm not going to keep fighting a guy, especially a guy the caliber of Vicente Luque. Yeah, he's a tough, he's a tough customer. He's, it's, it's going to, it takes a lot to put him away, but. He's never been knocked out, has he? I... Now that I think about yeah. it. I think in MMA, he's never... Yeah, he's only lost decisions. Well, and Cowboy right. submitted him. Right. But yeah, he's never been stopped with strikes. And it, was a fun, it was a fun fight. It was deserving a fight of the night, yes. Yeah. And again, Luke a turns in his second fight that will probably feature towards the end of... Towards fight of the year discussion. I, I don't think he's taken that crown. There were two better fights. Not all that long after his fight with Barbarina, but they're still great fights. All right, as for the rest of this card, um, Eduardo Garagori defeated Umberto Bondenai via unanimous decision, 30-27 across the board. Neither of these guys should be in the UFC. They are not UFC caliber fighters right now. Not to say they can't be in the future, but Bondenai got to extend his UFC career based on scoring one memorable knockout at a tough Latin America f finals event. He wasn't even in the finals. But he was one of the competitors. They gave him a shot at, on the show. He knocked a guy out with a knee. So they kept him around, and he's done nothing but lose sense. He's not a UFC caliber fighter at this point in time. Neither is Garagori. This fight was... Uh, this fight was every regional MMA fight you've ever seen. It's not that good. It's not that interesting. It just exists. Um, Vulcan Uzdemir knocked out Ilya Latifi in the second round with punches. Uh, Latifi just never got a way to reliably close distance and deal with the range disparity he was at. Uh, I'm not going to say this is the biggest win of Uzdemir's career because he's scored a few bigger ones in his run up to the title. But I think if you look at his last fight with Reyes and his fight here with Latifi, 
and you just consider his skill set and what he's doing, he is looking very, very skilled. He, uh, he's got all of the elements kind of clicking finally. So he's looking good and continues. Uh, he broke a three fight losing streak, but it's also light heavyweight. So just stick around long enough. You'll get another shot. Uh, the UFC debut of jujitsu, uh, darn near legend, Adolfo Vieira, went very well. He submitted Oscar Pijota with an arm triangle choke in the second round. For those of you unfamiliar with Vieira, would be considered the best black belt of his era, if not for a couple of guys, uh, like specifically Bouchesha, who has kind of stalled him whenever they meet in the absolute division. Uh, that's the only guy he's lost to in the last like several years of jujitsu competition. If you go way back, he lost like Rafael Lovato Jr., who's another stupendous black belt. I think Dean Lister got him once, too. But, it, again, tremendous, tremendous jiu-jitsu competitor. Scored a win here. Um, he looked like a guy who has, was on his sixth pro fight. He's still really stiff on the feet. There's still some cardio issues that he's got to work out. But uh, his jiu-jitsu is top-notch, so uh, definitely someone to be aware of. Enrique Barzola defeated Bobby Moffat via split decision. Uh, 129-28 for Moffat, 129-28 for Barzola, and a 30-27 for Barzola. I don't agree with 30-27. Uh, I don't know. I didn't care for this fight. I disagree with the 30-27 because it gives Barzola the first round based off of a nothing takedown in the last five seconds of the round. And I just don't think that mattered in that fight at all. Uh, on the prelims, Gilbert Burns defeated Alexei Konchenko via unanimous decision, 29-28 across the board. Good for Burns. He stepped in on very short notice here, up a weight class, to fight an undefeated guy that no one really wanted to fight. And he did well the first couple of rounds. He gassed a bit in the third, and the leg kick started getting to him. But he gutted through it and was able to secure the win, so good for him. Um, Cyril Gan defeated Rafael... Uh, Pessoa Nunes. I think he just goes by Rafael Pessoa. Anyway, he choked him out with an arm triangle choke in the first round. Uh, Gone is... has done a bit of kickboxing. He's done a little bit of Muay Thai. And the big reason he's... it took a while for him to debut in MMA is he's French. And France has, for the last few years, had a ban on the sport of mixed martial arts being practiced. It's actually illegal. That will stop in 2020. They voted on that recently. But Gunn's got some skills. Uh, for a heavyweight, he's light on his feet. He does a lot of switch hitting. Uh, so, again, he's very, again, he's still kind of raw. This was only like his fourth fight. So he could not exactly pan out. But, eh, you know, it's heavyweight, so you take him where you can get him kind of thing. Marina Rodriguez defeated Tisha Torres via unanimous decision. Two 30-27s, one 30-26. Not sure about 30-26, but this was a really good fight from Rodriguez. Uh, she did a fair number on Tisha Torres throughout the course of this fight, and she only got stronger as the fight wore on. Kind of a weird thing to think about. Uh, just Well, not weird, but if you're... Uh, two of the primary women who were thought of to be who were thought to be at the top of kind of straw weight for several years were Tisha Torres and Jessica Aguilar, and they're both on pretty significant losing streaks right now. The sport is very cruel. Uh, Rogerio Bonterin defeated Harley and Paiva via doctor stoppage uh, about three minutes into the first round with a cut. This was a nasty cut over the right eyebrow of uh, Paiva. Uh, Bonterin hit him with a knee, punched it a few times. Uh, Dana White shared a photo of it backstage about to be stitched up. This was a nasty cut. Now that needed to be stopped. Uh, good fight for, you know, a two minute and 50 some odd second fight, but you know, they're flyweights that tends to happen. Chris Gutierrez defeated Geraldo de Freitas via split decision, uh, 220, 20, excuse me, 229, 28 for Gutierrez, 130, 27 for de Freitas. Yeah. A little iffy on that 30, 27, but, uh, not a bad fight actually. Uh, some fun back and forth exchanges. Both guys had moments to shine and eh, not complaining. Uh, Alex De Silva defeated Rodrigo 
excuse me, he is Mexican. So Rodrigo Vargas, uh, 30, 27 across the board. De Silva, just a better fighter everywhere. And then kicking everything off, Veronica Macedo with a little bit of an upset um, in terms of how she won, submitted Pollyanna Viana with an arm bar. Uh, only a bit of an, again, only an upset in terms of how it happened. I think Macedo was technically a bit of a favorite there. But, you know, women's flyweight, as we mentioned earlier, does need some, you know, fighters to kind of step up to the plate. And if Macedo is going to be going to put herself in a position to do that, more power to her. All right. That was the rest of the fights. Again, a couple of decent things in there. A lot of just kind of meh, a lot of meh. So, Jeff, is there anything else that you wanted to touch on? Volkan Ozdemir got a much needed win over Ilar Lutifi and. Busted up his face. That, w- that was something that happened last night. All righty. He yeah. was coming off 0-3, so he really needed a, a win to justify his spot on the roster. He really did. And you know, good for him. You know, I mean, you could argue he won the Reyes fight. That's a perfectly valid a scorecard for him in that fight is not out of line at all. But. Of the three guys scoring, whose opinion actually mattered, two of them gave it to Reyes. So anyway, thanks to those of you who did happen to read along live or after the fight. Yeah. I know this was not a very well-publicized card. So thank you very much to those of you that uh, did stop by and say hello. I always appreciate you guys. All right. This coming Saturday, the UFC is back on pay-per-view. In Anaheim. And- they are in Anaheim, this. The Honda Center. My neck of the woods. I don't suppose you got cre- credentialed for this. No, I didn't. Ah, sorry. Ha, 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 ha. Huh? People at MacLife still get credentialed, though. That's in- kind of interesting. Yeah, Probably indeed. Probably checked recently, but... <sighs> well, again, this is, a, this is actually a really solid card. It is a solid considered. card. Your main event, a rematch between Daniel Cormier and Stipe Miocic for the heavyweight title. Uh, Cormier defeated Miocic via knockout in the first round to win the belt last year. Uh, yeah, July of last year. And so, oh, Miocic hasn't fought since He's that. not fought since. And Cormier had the one fight when he kind of embarrassed Derek Lewis. Right. Um, you know, this is about the best heavyweight fight you can make right now. Uh, based on merit. And I was excited going into their first fight. I'm not as excited this time. Well, we've seen them fought once. Cormier pretty decisively knocked out Miocic, but I guess you can say Miocic did give him some problems. And Miocic had some success. For as long as that fight lasted, Miocic had success with a bit of his boxing. He struggled a bit to get around the mummy guard of Cormier, right. but he was finding some success. He was, it was not... Like poke or something, right? Hmm? There was controversy over an eye poke or something. Yeah, there was a little bit of one, yeah. Um... But just you know, Cormier found a habit that Stipe has when he exits the pocket in the clinch and was able to exploit it. Uh, I, there's... Mean, I still see ways Stipe can win this fight. I think they're pretty evenly matched. I, um, but I don't know. I'm still kind of feeling Cormier this time, but we'll see. Yeah, my big thing about this fight, and again, I'm looking, let me be clear, I am looking forward to it. But. I'm struggling to come up with a decisive, with a really kind of compelling reason to think it's going to go differently. I kind of feel if these guys fought 10 times, you could get various different outcomes each time. Yeah, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of ways that it could go again. If one of them really decides to wrestle, how will that go? We don't know how this fight looks if it goes long. I mean, both guys have documented, have a documented ability to fight for five rounds. That's Both definitely good, a thing. Have good cardio. But, you know, Cormier is a little soft to the body, and Miocic didn't really get a chance to try and exploit that in the first fight. And again, I don't hold that against him. They fought for, you know, three minutes or something. Stipe is hittable. Stipe is very hittable. His, he's got a good chin, but anybody can, can be caught. Uh, again, anybody can be caught. 
And he was. And Cormier, for that matter. Yeah, and I mean, Cormier's defense does leave him vulnerable to certain techniques, specifically the right side of his body and very specifically kicks. He's uh, the way he chooses to employ his defense. He's a, again, he's a little bit vulnerable to the midsection. He's been hurt there before. And the style of guard that he employs, again, the mummy guard, is great at disrupting punching lanes. He doesn't really tend to work over the body a lot, though, as I recall. It's not something he does a tremendous amount of, but it is something he could, it is an avenue he could pursue in this fight. Well, so again, I'm looking forward to it, but uh-huh. I'm struggling to pick against Cormier this time around. And I'm picking Cormier, but I'm not like super committed to it just because Stipe is very highly skilled. And look, he's the first man who defended the heavyweight title three times for a reason. You know, he is a good, he's a very Except he's a good fighter. He's an exceptional athlete. Um, yes. Steve is maybe the most accomplished heavyweight in UFC history. I mean, he, de- I mean, he, 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 it's not even a maybe he is. I think the only, the only guy who might come close and I'd have to go back and double check a few statistics would be Randy. And even then the level of opposition that Steve well, has faced I mean, is so much better. It depends. I mean, I guess it depends. You could, you could probably put Cain Velasquez in that conversation, but Kane had the injuries and, he, and, and the long layoffs too. Um, if I think if Stipe re- regains the title here, he is unequivocally, especially if he beats Daniel Cormier decisively. I think he's unequivocally the best heavyweight in UFC history, mm-hmm. and is starting to give Fedor a bit of a run for his money as far as that goes. So, I mean. I would say Cormier has already surfa- surpassed Fedor. There's certainly an argument for that, and I wouldn't disagree too much. Um, and I don't want to. I don't want to get. I think we can talk about what we'll talk about what's next after we see this fight, because you never know. Um. Uh, yeah. So I'm picking Cormier for this one. <laughs> So if Cormier wins, do we think he retires? No. No, what do you think he... And he's already broken his promise to retire when he turns 40, so... Um, I think he's just waiting. He Look, there are so many ifs. I think he's he knows he can make probably the, the biggest payout of his career if he gets that third fight with Jones. And ha- that's a tough thing to say no to, you know? It can be. Goldberg re- uh, wrestling in Saudi Arabia for, an, uh, you know. Oh, he, uh, Cormier, Cormier will not be making Goldberg Undertaker sweet Saudi money. He'll be making good money, but he won't be making that. How do you know? Because the UFC is not going to pay them the millions of dollars that were forked over to those two for a 15-minute nostalgia match. One million for that one match. Hmm? Goldberg made one million for that one match. You, you he, mean to tell me Cormier wouldn't easily clear seven figures? Who gave? Oh, no, no, no. Goldberg made a million from disclosed. I, I would guarantee you he made more than that for that match. I would guarantee Goldberg made more. Meltzer says it says the payout was a million. And that's Dave Meltzer. I'm just saying. I would bet. I would have bet money that if you asked him what he told, what he cleared in totality from that event, it's more than that. Uh, as for how much Cormier would make to fight Jones for a third time, yeah, you're probably around a million. He, I, I would say he easily would easily clear seven figures easily. Well, what's, well, what's he make? Well, what's his show win situation? I forget with Cormier. Cormier. Yeah, what's, what's he get paid to show and win? So, so the one the isn't UFC two thirty. So they probably had disclosed payouts. I don't know. New York's a little bit funky with that. Some uh, some states do, some states don't. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I know Florida uh, mandates. Uh, d- 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 640, 600,000. So he makes 600 to show, or does he make 300 to show and 300 to win? Derek Lewis, plus he got 40,000 for his, you know, uh, uh, the, what is it? The 
the title, the champion, uh, out, the outfitting pop, the Reebok, the Reebok money. So 640000 for that fight. So yeah, I, he would make some. I, he would make a comparable figure to Goldberg for probably for this fight too. Oh, he might be. Oh, okay. So Cormier's on flat money then. Yeah. Okay. So he would do. He's going to do okay for this fight, but he would probably make even more. He would probably make even more for that third fight with Jones. Which they I could mean, still no, and they could still do even in a loss, because the money would be there. Well, I mean, but, he'll make more if he renegotiates his contract between now and then. Right, which he could, and and if he's still champion, and you, it, it depends on how much the UFC really wants that fight with Jones, and how much they really want it with a belt on the line for the heavyweight title. So those are the, I mean, the that's you know. Everyone's going to be talking about that this week, but um, the major roadblock is Stipe. So, and Stipe is a hell of a roadblock, Robert. So, oh yeah, heck, you he, could—I mean, you could take, and you know what, you could technically do Stipe versus Jones too. You could. That would and be, I be opposed, and I wouldn't be opposed to that. That would be a very interesting fight, as far as that goes. I mean, <laughs> Jones at heavyweight is a bit of a mystery. Because we've long speculated about how good he would be there. But there's a few things that he does and there's a few advantages he enjoys that don't translate one-to-one up at heavyweight. But if he were to go... I feel like he would need time if he wanted to make the move up. Like, would it really be okay to see that in six months or, I don't know, eight months? Who knows? I mean, again, you could, and because it's heavyweight, but if he wanted to go in and fight for the belt, I'd want I'd want him to take at least eight months. Yeah. And really, you know, okay, dedicate himself to figuring out how he feels at heavyweight. Dedicate himself to, you know, adding on the extra muscle, learning to fight with the extra muscle. Uh, because that's a big deal. I mean, Stipe Miocic is a large person. Not just in height, Stipe's shorter right. than John. But Stipe's what two? He weighs in routinely what the two forties? Four. Isn't John? No, oh, no, John's not. Sorry, he and John are about the same height then, because John's for some reason I thought he was six six, but he's yeah. yeah, they're about the same height. But Stipe routinely weighs when he fights what two forties? Yeah, yeah, that's and John might weigh that rehy. He doesn't weigh that rehydrated, but he probably weighs in the two twenty, uh, you know, twenties to low thirties rehydrated. But John has really long, but John has those long limbs too. Uh, John will have a reach advantage, right? Um, he's built eh. so freakishly. Yeah, I kind of like, kind of like. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't want to talk about that too much yet, but. We'll see. We'll see what happens here. So we've got at least we've got a good heavyweight title fight here until we reach uh, such a bridge. So, and we got a good co-main event too. All things, even though assuming it holds together, yeah, we have Anthony Pettis and Nate Diaz. And I have gone back and forth on this fight trying to pick it. Um, if this were five rounds, I would pick Nate Diaz without a lot of hesitation. I think he fights better over longer periods of time. Uh, Certainly relative to Pettis, he does. I mean, I think Anthony Pettis has only won one five-round fight that went the distance. I'm picking Diaz. My only issue is that Diaz hasn't fought in, like, a century, but... Yeah. He's fighting old, declining Anthony Pettis. Yeah, Pettis will have a good round or so. He's going to land some really hard leg kicks, I imagine. He'll do some of his flashy stuff. He'll bust up Nate's face a little bit because Nate gets busted up. But Nate pushes a good pace. Nate's a pretty relentless pressure fighter. Pettis can be a little too patient sometimes, too. He can. And, again, he doesn't... I I feel like this is a better matchup for Diaz than if this were Tony Ferguson... Oh, yeah, God, no. That. Tony would kill. I would pick Tony over either of these guys. I mean, he already beat Pettis. He's not fighting, a, like, he's not fighting a guy with wrestling, you know? Um, 
No, yes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be surprised if either of these two actually shoots a double. Um, <laughs> I don't think they will. Yeah, I, I'm picking Diaz yeah, as well. My only concern is this is Diaz's first fight in th- three years. Yeah, he's been out since the McGregor rematch. Like, who even cares that, that Nick Diaz uh, got suspended for, like, five years or however for what, um, after his last? He hasn't fought. So what what big a deal is it he got suspended for that long? Um, but Nate Diaz hasn't fought in three. Um, and that's insane. And Diaz is how ha- Diaz is 34 now. Um, yeah. God, he is. That's crazy to me. Because I remember his U. I remember him on that season of Tough. It was but, early 20s. The difference is the difference is is that for the last three years Diaz hasn't been getting ripped apart like Anthony Pettis has. Pettis has been through a bit yeah. of a wood chipper, man. <laughs> More than a bit. I mean, yeah, in his last in the last couple of years, he what? He's Stop. fought Max Holloway, who melted him. Tony Ferguson. He beat Jim Miller. He got he got abused by Dustin Poirier. He got beat abused by. Ferguson too. Yeah, he beats uh, beat Kiesa. He and Ferguson had a crazy fight, but yeah, he got Max torn Holloway, up by Tony. Max Holloway messed him up too. Yeah, yeah, Holloway. Mel- yeah, Edson Barboza did a number on him. <laughs> but Pettis couldn't make weight. Um, did not make weight. I mean, even Stephen Thompson had a lot of success, kind of busting up his face before think, he got caught. Uh, some years back, we thought Pettis might have been a good challenge for Jose Aldo at featherweight. That fight was going to happen at one point. Yeah, it's a shame it didn't. I don't Did know. It? I think I don't know. I mean, look, I'd, I'd have picked Aldo, but it's still it's a shame it didn't happen. Is all. It's probably better for Pettis because he was because that way he was able to fight Henderson. He was able to win. Was able to win a UFC title out of that. So I think it's it's better that he didn't have to. It probably would have been better for him if he were to make a run at 145. It probably would have been better if it happened at that time when he was a lot younger. He probably could have handled the weight cut back then, but not anymore. Yeah. Um, but look, Pettis did become a champion, and he did. You know, he he was the first guy to finish. I think he was the first guy to finish Gilbert, right? Um, he might have been the first guy to submit him, but I don't think he was yeah, the first. Yeah. Yeah, first guy to finish Gilbert Melendez. Was yeah. he really? Yeah, he was. Dang. Um, He's still well, the only guy to finish Gilbert. Holy crap. I mean, look, Pettis has, had, all, Pettis has had a pretty good career, but he did. I still think he did kind of peak kind of early. Yeah, yeah. He, what? Like, but they put him on the Wheaties box, and it was all downhill from there. Yeah, but he, but he's done, but he did well for himself. He did. He has he has a he has a legacy. Um, God, if Diaz can just keep a jab going the same way that Thompson did, yeah, he's gonna bust him up. Hall of Fame career, but like you know, no, they let just about anybody into the Hall of Fame, so he'll probably wind up there. <laughs> the Showtime kick. Yep. Look, the Showtime kick is one of the coolest highlights ever. You can't deny that. I remember watching that live. I woke up some people in my house when he landed yeah. that. It was crazy. It was absolutely insane. But yeah, I'm picking Nate Diaz here, but that, that has some potential. It's a good fight. Also, with some potential in a good fight, your featured bout, Yoel Romero will fight Paulo Costa in a battle of... Uh, Boy, we're both clearly not on steroids. The Juan yeah. Romero's fight, last fight, was June of last year. Romero's 42. Romero's 40. Doing it for the old guys. Um, Paulo, I, this is really a huge test for Paulo Costa. Massive. Easily the biggest of his uh, career so far. Costa hasn't fought in a while either. Wow. It's kind not of, a little over a year. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, okay. So there was, uh, there was, there was a kind of, uh, there was a kind of uh, thing with. There was a bit of an indiscretion with Paulo Costa, wasn't there? Yeah, he had a he. He got suspended for what using an IV to rehydrate that USADA didn't okay. approve of, kind of thing. Okay. Well, I mean, we, I mean, there's no, there's no real excuse for that. I mean, we've known about this. 
It's again, it's a stupid oh. policy, but it is the policy. Well, I I'd argue that it isn't stupid, but um. So what do I think here? I'm going with Romero. Yeah, I I mean the only guy at middleweight to beat Romero is Robert Whitaker. He has I would run through, only, but. Romero's Romero's a pretty high level f- a fighter. He's got the wrestling. He has knockout power. Very strong. Um, this guy, the, he has a he has decent cardio. Uh, we've never seen. Have we ever even seen Co- Costa fight a wrestler of this caliber? I, I no. Johnny no. Hendricks said that when. <laughs> No, At that point I was Johnny saying, Hendricks does not count in 2017. No. Moreover, even Hendricks at his best is not even close right. to the same kind of rest. I mean, look, Johnny Hendricks holds a couple of records at Oklahoma State and was a great collegiate wrestler. I'm not trying to take that away from him. There's I mean, a massive gulf in talent between collegiate wrestling and international wrestling, and Yoel Romero succeeded at the Romero, international level for Romero years. Romero has held up fairly well despite his advancing age, so I'm not pinning too much on that. Both uh, and both guys have been out of it for a while, so ring rust could be a factor. <laughs> they haven't been off for like a huge amount of time, but you know, when you miss over a year, that I mean, that's not an insignificant amount of time, Robert. That's Especially true for a guy like Paulo Costa, who's yeah, as young as he is, yeah, and. I mean, I give I'll give Romero a bit of a pass because that fight with Whitaker was a war. But, and if you need but, the time, take it. But if if Costa can can put on a masterful performance here, he's in the title picture. If he does win, yeah, I think that's we've got like a young new contender. If he can if he can somehow pull it off, yeah. I, I'm going with Romero as well. Costa, while he does have some skills, he has some pretty decent hands. And he's got power. He only really seems to know how to work properly when you're against the fence at he open space. The BJJ black belt under Noguera, so however much that is worth, we don't really see his. We haven't. See, the only thing is we haven't seen his ground game in the UFC, and I'm not sure how much that would really work against a guy like Romero, who's been yeah. in there with Jacare. Yeah. It, Romero's fought, you know, I mean, Jacare is one of the finest grapplers that's come into the sport. He all, I mean, he dealt fine with uh, Chris Weidman, who's another very, very talented grappler. Uh, he dealt fine with Tim Kent. Well, fine might be a bit of a Like, I he, feel like if he was on top and working in Costa's guard, he would probably be okay. Oh, yeah. Almost. Costa does not strike me as a bottom player. Um. But he does, like, he has that. We just haven't really seen it in his UFC run. True. So certainly he has this like he has this skill set. And look, some people have that skill set and they can't apply it where the damn in MMA. We true. see that a lot. I mean, yeah, we see a lot of strikers in MMA who come in and decide, boy, I'm gonna clinch you against the fence. A giant waste of time. It, 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 MMA is its own entity for a reason. And right. you know, elements of the game, elements of the individual pieces don't translate. Others do translate very well. And there's some stuff that you would never do in a pure, you know, a well, pure boxing know, match. In Noguera and Verdum's first match, like Noguera outgrappled uh, Verdum fairly competently, as I recall. Well, uh, hang on. Noguera and Verdum? I believe so. When they fought in Pride. I don't think they fought in Pride. You sure? Fairly. I might be wrong, but let me double check. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they, he lost to United. No, no. Oh, okay, I remember that. I do remember that fight. Okay. No, wait. Yeah. Hey, hang on. Make sure that's Big Nog. Yeah, that was Big Nog. Critical Countdown. Critical Countdown Absolute in 2006. I think... Late Pride. It was Late Pride. Yeah, I think Noguera spent most of that fight not grappling with Verdum. I'd have to rewatch the fight, so I could be missed. Like, I, 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 I felt like he took him down and just pretty much did whatever he needed to do. As I recall, but whatever. Well, I mean, in their rematch, that wasn't even close. Uh, Verdum comprehensively outgrappled him. 
Yeah, but their rematch was in 2013 when Nog had. Is it for Doom older than Nog? Mm. For Doom's 42. No, so there are but no, no, Nogueras 43, so he's a little younger. Yeah, okay, they're close enough close, though. Close enough. They're close to the same age. But well, I the point I'm trying to make is there like some guys who are just world what like world class elite level grapplers. You know, it won't always work for them in an MMA fight. And figuring out how to translate it, especially just with the gloves. I mean, right. If you got this, might yeah. seem like a weird thing, but Marcelo Garcia, for example, uh, tremendous, tremendous grappler, was stalled out in a couple of his you have his MMA fights because he just struck. He was great at taking your back. I mean, exceptional. He pioneered a, a very important position for maintaining back control called the seatbelt. It's one hand goes over the shoulder. It's like an over the shoulder seatbelt. One arm is going over, the other one comes under, and the hands clasp in front of your opponent. It's great for maintaining position. And if you don't have gloves on, you can start hand fighting, and you can, especially if you're really, really good, and Marcelo Garcia is exceptional, you can get chokes relatively easily. He was stalled out by guys who, in pure jiu-jitsu, he would murder because just because the glove position, the gloves change the ability to grip fight and to hand fight so dramatically. So, again, being able to translate it to a, you know, to a slightly different situation is a pretty big deal. All right. So next fight at Featherweight, we have Gabriel Benitez versus Sadiq uh, Youssef. Uh yeah, Yusuf is, I believe, undefeated. He's 2-0 and in the UFC, if nothing else. Uh, Gabriel Benitez... Won his last two against... He's been, a bit, he's been a bit up and down in the UFC. Yeah, yeah, but he has a winning record for right now. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, he knocked out Umberto Bondane in his last fight. That, was a, that slam was hilarious. Uh, but the UFC is a little bit kind of higher on Yusuf, I think. And Yusuf packs some pretty serious heat when he starts swinging. Uh, this this has some. Uh, I'm picking Benitez. This one has some potential. I'm gonna go with Yusuf actually. But this one has some potential to be fireworks. Those are two action fighters. It is. A, it is a step up in competition for Yusuf though. So oh yeah. It, it's a good test for him, I think. It's the biggest stage Benitez has been on in his UFC career. So uh, they're both getting a chance to step up. Yeah. True. True. All right. At middleweight, Derek Brunson will fight Ian Heinish. Uh, Ian Heinish has kind of grown on me over his couple of UFC fights because he gutted through some pretty serious adversity. His last fight in particular, he battled uh, Shoeface. I consider Brunson kind of like a an upper-level gatekeeper at this point. I mean, he's there's an argument Brunson's bordering on washed. I mean, he's not had a good it's run recently. And he's coming off a win. Not a good win, but it's... He's coming off of a win, technically, where he sent Elias Theodoru from the UFC. And part of me wants to, you know, deeply praise him for that, because I don't have to watch Elias Theodoru anymore. He lost back-to-back fights, but Israel Adesanya, who's interim champion fighting for the belt, Jacare, who's a, you know, perennial top five, top ten contender. So he's... He's had his successes, and I mean, his losses are to his losses are to legit opponents, is what I mean. Other than mm-hmm. Anderson Silva, <laughs> well, he should have won that fight. In all fairness, <laughs> okay, that, that was a bonus well, decision. He's, he's losing, he's losing, but he's losing to legit opponents, is my opinion. But the fight against Theodora wasn't good. Oh, it was terrible. It's just um, terrible. I'm actually leaning towards Heinish here, considering, um, look, considering that. Um, going back to that fight with Chris Lieben at UFC 155, I would say Brunson overall for his career has, has overperformed. I'd agree with that. Based on the expect, going by the expectations for him after that fight, I would say he has overperformed and he had, and he has had a, you know, he had a streak where, he, where before the Whitaker fight, he was doing quite well for himself at that time. He was time. on a good run going into the yeah. Whitaker. I mean, that fight with him and Whitaker was kind of designed to establish the next right. contender. So we're, you know, we're a bit of a ways out from that fight, but um, that's why I consider him like an upper-level gatekeeper type. 
Because look, he lost it. Look, Whitaker went on to become a champion. Israel Adesanya, interim champion, now the number one contender. You and know, don't sleep on him when he fights Whitaker either. Jacare and Jacare has hovered around that time for years, but can never like just get quite over the threshold. So, uh, this fight, I'm picking Brunson. I'm going with Heinish, actually. I expect a gr- I expect a grindy affair in a lot of ways, but I think Heinish has bet is better positioned to deal with that kind of fight. Brunson has been known to fatigue himself. Uh, doing extended clinch exchanges. Yeah. But who have we... Re- I mean... The guys Heinish has beaten, like, they're decent opponents, but they're not, like, anything exceptional. No, and I I also just don't think at this point Brunson's all that exceptional. I, Heinish, is a, Heinish is a decent prospect. I'll give him that. We'll see. A decent prospect. Really good, uh, you know story for those who go in for the human interest side of things. I'm favoring Brunson, though. So, yeah, Brunson. Yeah, I'm going with Heinish, but that might be a decent little fight. Um, on the prelims, we have the return of... Okay, so that that is your main card. Again, solid main card. There's one fight I would swap out from the main card for the prelims, and only one. Which is... I, I want to. I'd put Austin Sound Sandhagen in there uh, over uh, Ates and Yusuf. I agree. But on the prelims, Clay Collard is making his return to the UFC because he had a bit when the UFC where he went uh, one and three, and so uh, yeah, not good. Since being released, he's gone four and one, and he's taking this fight on short notice, replacing John McDessey. He's fighting Devonte Smith. He was a contender series guy that the UFC's kind of high on. I'm going to go with Smith. They 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 tend to be careful matching up these contender series guys and and Collard might upset the apple cart a little bit, but I uh, I'm a, I feel pretty good picking Smith. Uh, again, the the fight that should be on the main card, top-ranked bantamweights Rafael Austin Sal and Corey Sandhagen will fight. This is a good fight. I like this fight a lot. Uh, Austin Sow coming off of that loss to Marlon Marais, which was the first time he'd been finished uh, since he fought Eric Koch up at featherweight. That was his first time being finished at bantamweight ever. It was only his second loss at bantamweight. I mean, I, I get Austin Sow's not the easiest guy to engage with for a lot of fans, but really good fighter. And Corey Sandhagen is on a pretty significant hot streak. Uh, I mean, some of his other UFC fights, you know, they were good and they kind of got you interested in him. Then, you know, you beat John Lineker and that's a pretty big deal. John Lineker doesn't lose to a whole lot of guys. I I like this fight a lot. I think they match up very well. I think Sandhagen's mobility and constant pressure, constant angles will pose some problems for Austin Sow. By the same token, Austin Sow is a diverse enough fighter to really test Sandhagen's all-around game instead of him being able to kind of specialize in one area where he knows he's superior. So I'm really looking forward to that one. I am leaning with Sandhagen, actually, uh, which is odd. I don't pick against Austin Sow all that often, but I'm going to here. Uh, also at Bantyweight, Manny Bermudez will fight Casey Kenny. I think Kenny's a contender series guy. Um, I'll go with Bermudez, but I'm I'm not feeling a whole I'm not feeling a whole lot of excitement for that. I mean, Bermudez is a really good grappler. Uh, does a lot of good work off of his back, too. So if he's able to force that, and I think he will, so I'm going to pick him. But I, I'm not feeling a tremendous amount of anticipation for that fight. Drakkar Close and Christos Yagos might be okay. Um, Close on a pretty on a good, he's got a good UFC record. His only loss is to David Tamer. Uh, whereas Yago, Sagas has been a bit up and down. On a two-fight winning streak, though. And yeah, go with Close. Close is a tough guy to kind of get a handle on when you're fighting him. In women's strawweight, Hannah Cyphers will fight Jody Escobel in a fight that would be right at home on an Invicta card. Um, Escobel has yet to win in the UFC. Um, I'll go with Cyphers, but yeah, who knows? At Bantamweight, Mr. Perfect Kyung Ho Kong is back. That makes me happy. 
Uh, he submitted Teruto Ishihara in February of this year. Jeez, his only UFC loss. He's got two. He has the one to Chico Camus. That was pretty definitive. I thought he won the Ricardo, uh, the Hamos fight. I mean, he's fighting Brandon Davis, who I don't think is really a UFC caliber fighter. Uh, his only wins in the UFC are over Steven Peterson, who is not a UFC caliber fighter, and Randy Costa, who I don't think is a UFC caliber fighter either. So I'm going to go with Kong there, who is a UFC caliber fighter. And at the moment, kicking everything off is Sabina Mazo, uh, who I believe is the UFC's only Colombian fighter, fighting Shayna Dobson. And I'll go with Mazo there. There's so. They are trying to find a replacement. Uh, there was supposed to be a fight between Marina Moros and Poliana Botello. Moros pulled out. Um, apparently, I don't know. There's been a bit of... Botello says they're not going to be able to find her an opponent. A few things list that is still being looked into, so I'm not sure. But she does not have an opponent listed right now. If they do find something, if that does wind up fighting, I'm okay picking her in the dark. But if she's off the card, fair enough as well. All right, so that's our prelims again. There's a couple of decent, there's a couple of decent fights there. There's a few that have some pretty serious potential. So, Jeff, what are you looking forward to from the prelims? Mainly the Austin Sal versus Sanhagen match. That's a, it's a pretty legit fight that I think is probably getting overlooked. Um, probably because Austin Sal's coming off that loss, but Austin Sal's consistently been at the top of the division for quite a while. Um, he just couldn't get over the hump in those key fights. And then Sandhagen is definitely a, a guy we should be paying attention to. His uh, four-fight winning streak. Plus, he has that win over John Lineker. Um, and Yuri Alcantara, who also was a tough opponent for a while. Um, so, yeah, that's a good fight. All right. Uh, this coming Saturday, we'll have coverage of that in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania. So stop by, say hello. Again, that's hopefully we can get excited about that card, and it doesn't disappoint. Um, uh, just hope, hope it holds together. Hope it holds together. All right. As for news, this has been a pretty light news week. Uh, the only thing that really kind of stands out to me was former lightweight champion and uh, three time featherweight title contender Frankie Edgar announced he's moving to bantamweight for his next fight. Uh, what again, do you think of Robert? Based on his stature, it's his more natural weight class. Unfortunately, this does seem a little bit like the guy, you know, a guy later on in his career trying to revitalize it by cutting more weight. Because Frankie's been, I mean, I don't think Frankie's, you know, a washed fighter. But he's been around a lot. He's not exactly a young man, especially in terms of the sport. He's can't remember how old he is. He's 37. Yeah, he's he's not a young guy, not a spring chicken anymore. But again, this is kind of the weight class that his body's a bit more suited for. He literally was not cutting weight when he was fighting at lightweight. And normally when you cut weight, you wind, if you go through a, a structured weight cut, you wind up about 20 pounds lighter than your walk-around weight. And he was walking around at 152, 154, somewhere in that range. So with a good weight, with a good plan, with a, you know, a smart cut, he could fight at 135. I think that's what he wrestled at. When he wrestled in, uh, because he only played, he only wrestled in uh, high school. I don't think he wrestled all that much in college. I'd have to. Uh, no, no, he wrestled in college. Excuse me, I, I apologize. I'm mistaking him, but I think when he wrestled, he was around the 130 mark. That's that was his wrestling weight. So this isn't uncharted territory for him as far as that goes. But when was he wrestling, though? Probably well, what? Like we're talking about two decades. Uh, a little last, less than that, but yeah. Like o over, we're talking a period of over 15 years. And he probably had his last wrestling match, correct? Probably somewhere around there, yeah. Um, I 
I just think it's kind of late for him to be starting, you know, to try and reinvent himself as a Bantamweight. Uh, I'm not saying he can't do it, and I'm, I'm a little more respect, receptive to Frankie doing it than what we've seen out of BJ Penn for the last few years. Um, I think he can probably be slightly competitive, but we'll see. I mean, he puts together two or three decent wins. They'll put him yeah. into the title picture, and he'll be... Yeah, let's, let's see if he can, if he can do that, Compe- you know. I mean, he doesn't even really... I can accept, basically, I can accept Frankie doing this forever. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to put at Faber least, in at there after. One fight. Yeah, I, I at least try your hand. Try I don't out, want to know. see another fight between him and Faber, though. I'm sorry. I don't. I mean, I enjoyed their first fight for what it was, but I don't need to see it again. It was, it was a lot of Frankie doing what Frankie does and Faber I, not like being able to adjust. A lot of Legends rematch between Frankie and uh, Uriah. Is that what you want? Not especially. I, I mean, mean, don't get me wrong. I like watching Uriah Faber lose, and he would again. Because I, I don't think he can beat Frankie Edgar. That's, the thing is, Frankie's older now. It might not be his... They're cool both people. older. I mean, he and Faber are not that far apart in age. Well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about Frankie now. It might not be as easy for him to cut. Because it's still weight he's got to get off. Eh, true. And as you said, he's not a young man anymore. Faber's older. Oh, God, I forget that. Faber is older than Frankie Edgar. Right. But, you know, eight, it's not exact. The age thing isn't exact with everyone in MMA, you know? It's, again, I'm not saying either of them should retire again necessarily. Some guys hit the wall. Some guys hit the wall. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying Frankie needs to retire, but. Hey, look, if they if they fight I'm again, to, I'm willing to if if he wants to make the move down, I'm willing to give him the chance here. Yeah, I'd like to see what he looks like. He basically. doesn't lack he doesn't lack credibility as much as um, BJ Penn, basically. Now, I, I'm I'm okay with him giving it a shot, and he's trying to be a guy to fight for titles in three different weight classes, which well, might be a first. No. He might, who else fought for titles in three different weight titles, classes? Okay, titles in three weight classes. And uh, I know other guys have fought across three weight classes. Kenny did two. No, Kenny fought in three. He fought in three, but only fought for titles in two. That's Yeah. So fighting for titles in three. I don't know if that's... I think he'd be the first. You, I'd have to really look, but I think you're right. I think for, for competing for titles... In three UFC divisions, I think he would be the first because Connor, because Connor won two and fought for two, but he hasn't fought at welterweight. He hasn't fought for the belt at welterweight. Right. So yeah, I think you could be right. So, you know, so bantamweight, I uh, I'd be fine with Jimmy, like uh, Jimmy Rivera. What do you think? Ian Rivera are teammates, I think. I don't care. Yeah, he does. What about Cody Stannon? That's a good one. Does Cody uh, fight coming up? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Uh, he might, though. Uh, St- Stammen would be a good one. I'll say Bantamweight. Okay. Again, you could do the hey, rem- uh Fight Rob Font in June. Uh, Font's got a fight coming up, but that's a good fight. Who's uh, Font uh, fighting? I like, Stan- I like the Stammen one, if there, if that can work out. Well, that would be a pretty good one. Uh, uh, John Dodson? Dodson? Dodson. Dodson's an option. Yep. I'm j- or Thomas Almeida, even. I'm just not into... No, I, I don't want another fight with Faber. Uh, I mean, again, I'm not I'm not all that interested in it. I think it would play out exactly the same way their first one did. And, uh, uh, you know, you... Okay, no, no. I, if you wanted to go higher up in the rankings, you could do uh, Frankie Edgar and Cody Garbrandt. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't think Garbrandt should be ranked seventh in the world right now. I think he would. But he is. I think he would probably eat Garbrandt. I don't know. For, for I don't know. Maybe it's irrational, but I think I would pick Frankie to win that fight. I might favor Frankie, man. I mean, <laughs> look, look. I think we when when we have seen Garbrandt actually at his best, he's absolutely brilliant. Right. But. He, for whatever reason, the current setup at Team Alpha Male does not play to his strengths. 
I mean, uh, I I listened to part of what uh, Justin Buckholz said about. Wait, wait. Brandon Moreno got let go from the UFC, right? Uh, they brought him back at fl- oh. I wait. Wow. Yeah, he, he was gone. They brought him back for the Mexico card. Oh. I, is it crazy I didn't even realize they brought him back? No. Because um, the UFC doesn't care about flyweights. That is, so, that, that is so bizarre. That would happen. Apparently they couldn't find another Mexican for the card, so they brought him back into the fold for a fight. Why would you even let him go in the first place? You're asking the UFC for logic as it pertains to how they handle the roster at flyweight. It doesn't exist. (laughs) Uh, All right. Well, there are are some good options down there for Frankie. Um, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I'm not not sold on it, but I'm willing to wait and see how that goes for him. I'm curious to see what he's able to accomplish down there because... Again, Frankie's an excellent fighter in a lot of respects. Mm. Even if he's also, oh, I don't want to argue. So I'm not. I'm going. I'm going to hold my potential hot take, and because uh, I don't want to argue about it right now. But yeah, so I think that was the biggest piece of news. Uh, was there been anything else that you're aware of, Jeff? Because this was, from what I could tell, this was a light week. Um. I, f- I feel like there was some things that fighters were talking about on Ariel Hawani's ESPN show, but I'm not really recalling like what the big. Well, Colby and Usman are making noise at each other. Um, I mean, Col- eh. Colby got congratulated by the president for from his uh, after the Lawler fight, so good for him, I guess. Yeah, we saw that the night of the the fight, though. Um, Dana White wants to reteam with FX for the new season of The Ultimate Fighter. Oh God, this piss on called- that show! It's I don't dead. Know if that would work. Look, it's done. It's been done for a while. The UFC's stubborn refusal to let it die. Yeah. Hmm? Are they still producing it? Like, what happened? It is. It does not have a home right now. Dana is still trying to find a spot for it. Oh, here. okay. Uh, because he won't let it die. Let it die. ESPN didn't want it on ESPN+. Plus. No one wants this. Either make it a Fight Pass exclusive where you control all the content or let it die. Okay, here's a fight. That got announced a couple days ago. Nicholas Dalby versus Alex Oliveira at UFC Copenhagen. I think that's a decent matchup. For, for uh, I guess that'll be welterweight. A decent fight. Yeah, Nicholas Dalby is... Uh, I think underrated. I was not... I was a little surprised when they let him go, in all honesty. Uh, he's had some good fights. I, I mean, his first fight... His fight with... Uh, the fight that went to a draw with... Darren Till is a really good fight. Uh, he's coming off of that crazy fight. This is legitimately one of the craziest situations you'll ever see. He and his opponent bleed so much that the canvas becomes unsafe to fight on. They're literally trying to pass someone. I think it was Dalby is literally trying to pass guard and his feet keeps keep slipping out from under him because of all the blood on the mat. Okay. It, it, if you haven't seen it, it was from a ca- the one of the most recent Cage Warriors events. It's on Fight Pass. Look it up. Totally nuts. Okay, here we go. So we have a few fight fights that are coming up. Okay. Holly Holm will fight at UFC 243 uh, against Raquel uh, Pennington. So not qu- that's not quite a career yet for Holly Holm. I kind of wish you'd call it. I mean, she has... She's had a great career in a lot of respects. How many more? How many more title fights does she need to lose? I don't know. <laughs> Same number as Faber, if I had to guess. At least she she has one UFC, one more UFC title win than Faber does, or will. Uh, okay. Um, according to Dana White, uh. Covington receives the next title shot. George Masvidal will be uh, offered a new opponent. 
Uh, this is from MMA Fighting. Where did he say this, though? Probably a media scrum. On Tuesday. It doesn't really it doesn't really say where this came from, but so that's so apparently they're keen on Covington versus Usman. Of course they are. I don't know who because cringy trash talk. I don't know who Mo, who they have in mind for Masvidal, but we'll see. They'll probably try to make the Edwards fight. I mean, I would it, be fine with Masvidal versus Usman as well. Ditto. Uh, Eric Spicely versus Brendan Al- Allen for ESPN six. Uh, that fight uh, was announced on the Contender Series. Okay, so apparently, so he might have been talking about this uh, dur- um, when they had the Contender Series uh, last week. Okay, here's another one: uh, Davison Figueredo versus Tim Elliott on ESPN Plus in October. That's a good fight. They hired Tim Elliott back. Uh, apparently. And I guess it'll be Bantamweight. Yeah, of course it is. Because we couldn't actually have two decent flyweights fighting in the flyweight is, division. So this is from Combate. So we have... Uh, so this will be the Jan Jacek uh, versus Watterson card. Yeah, and I mean, the winner of that's probably fighting Jessica Andrade for the strawweight title. Okay, so this was probably a media scrum... Uh, at uh, the Contender Series. So, it looks like Dana White and Cyborg will not be sending other Christmas cards anytime soon. But they never got along. The relationship's busted. Sometimes fighters and promoters can't do business and just have personality clashes. It happens. Dealing with her has been a nightmare the entire time she's been here. And I said the other day in the interview with Laura... There was a lot of controversy bringing her in the first place at that time. And when I did the interview with Laura, we really didn't mention the whole her lying on the video about what I said. Her air quotes, production team air quotes, lying about what I said on the video. It's just been a bad experience dealing with Cyborg from day one. Um, Yeah, so... Look, they they never got along. Dana said a lot of bad but, things but, about her. She took it personally. They neither one of them could move on from it, and it just became more and more contentious. While. They gave her UFC title fights. I mean, they gave her they gave her a pointless title and a pointless division. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm I'm convinced they again they wanted to bring her in for the Rousey fight. Rousey, you know, got head kicked into oblivion and went away. I mean, they and then can, they were and then they, they were already paying they her, so they, may, her, so they may as well try to make money. Yeah, I mean, they did though. I think she drew reasonably. Yeah, well, they, no, she she was a surprisingly decent draw for them. Uh, I I seem to recall. I mean, again, she was never you know a million you know pay per view by draw, but she was a solid draw, all things considered. And just she and Dana never got along, and that happens. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what did, so she's unhappy, Warren happy. She lies and does that thing. See you later. Have <laughs> Yeah. Because right. Dana White is known for his honesty. Well, he's being honest here. So, um, Dana White subscribes to the Bob Arum school of when, of how you should believe what he says. Well, look, um, Bob Arum very publicly who once said, who was once asked, you said, was called on by a boxing, uh, some reporter who mentioned he said something completely different before a fight versus after a fight. Aram's honest-to-God response, you can find this on tape, was, yeah, but yesterday I was lying. <laughs> that's that's Dana White. Yesterday I was lying. All right. So there's that. Uh, so it seems like we're not seeing this relationship get repaired any time. I don't know if we're going to be... I doubt we're going to see Cyborg fight in the UFC again. All the more reason for WWE to sign her and pick her up and book a WrestleMania match with Ronda Rousey. Uh, and you know uh, I'm right on. You know if I'm all, right if all parties can come to terms on that, I, you know, go for it. I, I can't see why they wouldn't. I can see why they wouldn't, but I also think the worst of human beings. Book the, book, book the tickets to Mansion Land. Make it happen. 
I mean, if Rhonda lived in a state that wasn't California, she'd already be in a mansion. Is that where? Where is her ranch? She and she and Travis Brown bought a ranch together. Where is? I that? think I think it's in Cali somewhere. In I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know for sure. Yeah, I don't know where they're living now. But uh, anyway, so there. So I think that's all the kind of big media stuff from the last week. A couple, a couple decent fights in there. Oh, oh, here we go. One more. I'm sorry. Zabit okay. uh, Magomed Sharipov, also on UFC six versus Calvin Qatar. It will be the co-headliner. Yeah, I saw them announce that. I, I don't know why I didn't talk about it a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, you know, decent fight. It's maybe not co-main event worthy, but it's a decent matchup. I mean, Cater's considering that Zabit actually struggles with people who know how to strike with him, and Cater's a good striker. It'll ask some questions of Zabit that I'm curious to see him answer. But yeah, it's a it's a decent enough fight. Uh, I'm not. Com- oh. Corey Anderson versus Johnny Walker in the works for UFC 244. Not official yet. Eh, call me when it's official. Because <laughs> until then... Eh. That's from MMA fighting. I, For the record, I will pick Johnny Walker in that fight. I yeah. might pick Corey Anderson just for the lulls. I mean, it's Corey Anderson. If you All he has is the lulls. I mean, Corey Anderson is still on a winning streak, whether you like it or not. It's not whether I like it or not. It's whether I can remember it or not. Well, I can, I can remember it, and... Can you name me any... Without looking it up, can you name me one of his wins? I know how good Walker is yet. I'm like, aware of that. I also know that Corey Anderson is deeply susceptible to some of the stuff that Walker has demonstrated. Correct, but Walker might be too. To yeah. wall install? He could be, yeah. All right. Okay, he might be. That's that's look, fair. Sometimes it, look, we. I mean, we we've seen plenty of situations where these, you know, these tough strikers run into wrestlers and just don't know what to do. Yeah, again, that's fair. I, I just. That's I all, it's one of the best faces for the sport for a reason. It is, and I I also just don't think Corey Anderson is as good as advertised. You could be right. You could be right. Um, I mean, has well, Anderson even finished someone in the UFC? But, but if this matchup does get if this matchup does get made, I'm happy. I feel like it's a like a good it's a good uh, fight to make for Walker right now. It's a good it's a good fight to make for both guys. It's if a good progression for him, it's a good step up for Walker. And if and if Anderson can turn back another well, an exciting explosive up and comer like that to get his fourth win in a row. He almost certainly winds up fighting somebody very near the top of the division in his next fight and is in the title picture. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. All right. I think that's all the major news and fight matchups for the week though. All right. Let's get into plugs then. Uh, you've seen some stuff. You got some stuff going on. You've done a few interviews. What do you want to plug Jeff? Uh, so latest interview is uh, the one when I did a comic con with Bill Bill Fagerbaki, um, of Coach and SpongeBob fame. He's the voice of Patrick Starr for SpongeBob SquarePants for the last 20 years, so please check that out. Uh, Hobbs and Shaw was number one at the box office yet again, to your ever-loving pleasure, Robert. I'm sure you're very happy. Check out my review of that uh, over in Movie Zone. Uh, my next review uh, will be a DVD review of uh, Batman Hush. And also the Blu-ray of uh, uh, Avengers Endgame. Have that coming up. So be on the lookout for that. And yeah, that's all I got. All right. Uh, This last week, Mark Radlich and I reviewed Hobbs and Shaw. I still don't really know what I watched. Um, Yeah, did not care for that. But you can you can hear a more in depth discussion of that uh, on Damn You Hollywood over on the Radlich and Broadcasting Network. This week, Mark is taking a week off from Damn You Hollywood. He and Jesse Starcher will be doing a kind of a mixed review of the kitchen. They're going to talk about the uh, original graphic novel and then the movie starring Melissa McCarthy, which bombed, cratered on impact, dead. 
So they'll be talking about that on Monday. On Tuesday for Damn You Hollywood, myself, Alexis Haina, and Jason Teasley will be discussing scary stories to tell in the dark. The PG-13 horror movie that came out and was, I believe, number two at the box office this weekend. Uh, It's produced by Guillermo del Toro and directed by a Norwegian guy whose name I know I can't pronounce properly. I don't know what that accent means, and I apologize. But uh, he's a guy who I've kind of enjoyed. I really enjoyed Troll Hunter, actually, as far as found footage films go. Really nice blend of CGI and practical effects. So we'll be talking about that on Tuesday. Tune in for that. Saturday, again, coverage of UFC 241. And next week, we'll be back here to review UFC 241, talk about all the news of the week, and not preview anything, because the UFC is taking exactly one Saturday in the month of August off. And it's next Saturday, so yay. The week after, we'll be back to preview UFC uh, on ESPN Plus 15. This is the China card. I'm still not sure how they're going to handle some of these fighters. uh, Because the Chinese... How do I... I forget which... I forget which organization it was that did this within the Chinese bureaucracy... I believe it was their broad, uh, what their like broadcast group that said they they will not allow visible tattoos on fighters at all. Be that I mean, whatever the discipline is, MMA uh, was mentioned. So if you're in a so if you're a fighter with a tattoo and fighting in China, you have to cover it up. And some of that leads to problems because rash guards provide a lot of friction. I mean, a lot of local Chinese promotions just say if you have Visible. If you have tattoos that will be visible when you're fighting, they won't book you. So, and given Jessica Andrade's ink, that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be interesting. I think a lot of the other guys they have, they've kind of gone out of their way to find people who are light on ink, if not just missing it entirely for this card. Uh, I think Eliza Zaleski dos Santos has some, but I'd have to double check. Anyway, a couple of weeks we'll be back to preview that whole card. Uh, it's it's a card. Yeah, that's all I can say right now. Before I real, unless I wanted to really get into it. So we'll be back next week again. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Always appreciated. Thank you for sharing us on whatever social media platform you happen to use. Uh, thank you for reviews, be they positive or negative. Thank you for interacting with the material. Uh, always, always appreciated. Until then, on behalf of Jeff, I'm Robert. Stay safe out there and please continue to be well, be safe and behave.